All right, welcome back to the slides on induction and recursion. So we started this proof down here talking about corn. It was wonderful, but it didn't work out. The inductive hypothesis was not good enough because it was telling me that I could put corn or I can put a sprinkler in the middle of this plot, but that had nothing to do with the middle of the bigger plot, right? So we need, instead of this, we need a stronger proof. It's, it's a little weird how this works, but uh, the issue was that our hypothesis, the thing that we used to try to build the, the bigger answer, wasn't good enough for us. There was no way to like relate these four squares to the bigger square made up of each of them. And so here's the trick, all right? We need to strengthen our inductive hypothesis, which means we need to strengthen our proof itself. So here's what we're gonna prove instead. Here's the new theorem for every, look at the difference between this one and this one, like leaving out one in the center. Here's what we're gonna do. For every natural number, there is a way to tile a 2n by 2n plot with L-shaped plants while leaving out a one by one square, not just in the middle this time. We're gonna prove that we can leave it out anywhere, anywhere we want, all right? And so this seems like it's harder to prove, but it's actually gonna be easier. And if we can prove this, then that means that the thing that we really wanted, that thing with the thing out in the center, that would be fine, that would work out. So proving this gives us our old thing. So the best of all the worlds. So let's try this. So the base case for this proof, so remember there's base case, inductive step. The base case is gonna be the same as before. We have to show that we can put, we can fill a two to the zero, right? When, when n equals zero, same as before. We can fill a two to the zero by two to the zero, so one by one plot with the corn and, and put the sprinkler anywhere we want. Uh, well, we only have one place that we could put it, so we're kind of done, see that? So it still works, the base case is still fine, QED. And now the inductive step, you might think it's harder to prove, but it works out in our favor. Inductive step. So again, we assume, assume our, our predicate is true for, for some k, and we use it to, uh, and that's telling us, right, that that's gonna tell us how to fill a two to the k by two to the k plot. When we can leave out a sprinkler anywhere we want. And then what we need to show is p to the k plus one, right? Need to show p to the k plus one, which is gonna be that we need to figure out how to plot, or how to fill a two to the k plus one by two to the k plus one plot with our fancy corn and put a sprinkler anywhere we want again. So that's the secret. Let's let's figure this out. All right. So this is going to work out. So here's the inductive step. Let's make a new drawing. All right. What do we have to do? We have to fill this plot right here. Let's assume that this is two to the k plus one by two to the k plus one. Two to the k plus one this way by two to the k plus one this way tiles. And uh, again, I want to I want to be able to tile it in a way that leaves out a square somewhere, right up here, over here. It's supposed to be anywhere we want this time. I'll leave it out anywhere I want. So it could be here, it could be over here, wherever we want to leave it out. We could leave it out. That's what we have to prove. And we have some subplots, don't we? We have some. We have four exactly four to the k by two the k plots again that we could use our inductive hypothesis on. All right. That's telling us that we know how to do it this way. You know how to do it for the smaller plot. We have to show that we can do it for the bigger plot. So let's let's see if we can use that now. So again, we have to say we have to show that we can fill out. Uh, we can leave out a square somewhere. So it could have been could have been this to the k by two the k plot. It could have been this one. Could have been this one. Could have been this one. And honestly, it doesn't really matter where it was. It's symmetric either way. So let's say let's say without loss of generality, right? Because you could just turn the the picture. Let's say that this is where we wanted to put the sprinkler. So we're supposed to show that we can put it anywhere. Let's show that we wanted to put it somewhere in this first square, right? And you can just turn the picture to, to show that it works anywhere. So without loss of generality, finally, leave out a square in the upper left plot. Let's pretend that's where we wanted to leave out a square. Upper left plot or subplot, I don't know, let's call it that. Subplot. So that's where we wanted to leave it out. Uh, and we, 
uh, well, this is a two to the k by two to the k plot. We know how to do that, right? By the inductive hypothesis, was which was telling us we, we could fill a two to the k by two to the k plot anywhere we like uh, and leave out a square anywhere we like. So this one we get for free. Like we can fill that in perfectly for free. The inductive hypothesis gives us that. We can do this by the inductive hypothesis, or IH for short. And then for these other three guys, we have to show that like they, they build the bigger picture. Like we we have to like show that we can fill them in and not leave anything out. Because like this this was the place where we wanted to leave something out. Everything else needs to be filled in, right? So for the other three subplots. leave out, we, we know that for each of these, the, indu the inductive hypothesis gives us a way to tile these while leaving out a tile wherever we want. Let's leave out a tile right here. For this one, right here for this one, and right here for this one. By the inductive hypothesis, I can leave out a tile anywhere I want. I want to leave out these particular tiles, because look at what they look like together now with that empty space. I could shove another L-shaped piece right there. See that? So for the other three, leave out those inner corners, because now you can tile it. Do you see that? Leave out the inner corners. And then you can put another L-shaped tile here, and you've left out your one square. See that? We've done exactly what we set off to do. And so that was the inductive step with the base case. We have just proven this theorem. There is a way to tile any 2n by 2n plot with these plants, all leaving out a one by one square anywhere we wanted to. And so this was actually easier to prove. QED, it's done. And that implies our original theorem, which is great, because now I can leave one out in the center like I really wanted to. I just needed a stronger proof, a stronger inductive hypothesis to get me there. All right. So this is a little bit of a complicated example, but it's fun because it's, it uses pictures rather than numbers. But uh, definitely come back to this once I've done some more with just normal numbers, and hopefully it'll make some more sense. So that's a fun little example, I think. And now let's try some more. So I want you to start it, try to pause the video, give it a try, and then I'll show you my answer. But let's prove that this closed form exists for the summation. So like this is this is equal to sum of all the j's from 1 to n is uh, j times 2 to the j. That sum is equal to this closed form. See if you can find that, OK? And remember, you want to use a base case, an inductive step. So here is the scrolling on up to the definition of induction. OK? Here's another example. OK? So give that a try, and then I'll do it for you. So, OK, again, we have to find, like, what is our predicate? What are we trying to prove for all n? For all n, this it was kind of in the, in the sentence itself, which is nice. So the, all this right here, that's our p of, p of n. That's what, how we're going to define our predicate. And so uh, we want to prove this for any positive integer n. So we better start at 1, right? That's the first positive integer, the smallest one. So our base case better be n equals 1. And sorry, I can't write the letter s today. Base case n equals 1. And so I have to show, like plugging in 1 for n here, I have to show that the sum of all the j's from 1 to 1 of j times to the j is equal to n minus 1. If, if n is 1, it's 0, right? 0, 1 minus 1, times 2 to the 1 plus 1, or yeah, 2 to the 1 plus 1, 2 to the 2, 2, 2 squared plus 2. Uh, we need to show that that's equal. And so let's figure this out together. So this is going to be, uh, it's going to iterate just once, where j is 1. So this is going to be 1 times 2 to the 1, all right? which is, we have to show that that, this side is 2, right? We have to show that this is equal to what's well, going to be on the right-hand side. This is going to be 1 minus 1, that goes to 0, right? 0 times 4, that's nothing. So 0 plus 2, that is also 2. So we have to show that this is equal to this, and it definitely is. So that's our base case. And now let's do the inductive step. Assuming p of k, prove p of k plus 1. Use that to build up the bigger answer. So all right, what is what is p of k? So we're going to assume that this is true when n is when k is plugged in for n. So we want to assume the following. 
assume that the sum of all the j's, and I am having trouble making this sigma, the sum of all the j's starting at 1 all the way to k of j times 2 to the j, I think, right? Yeah, that's equal to n minus 1, so k minus 1 is equal to k minus 1 times 2 to the k plus 1 plus another 2. All right, so that's what we're assuming. That's our p of k, and we have to prove using that to show that p of k plus 1 is true. So like instead of k everywhere, put k plus 1. So the sum, we have to show that the sum of all the j's starting at 1 and going to k plus 1 this time Still the same thing, j times 2 to the j. Now that's equal to uh, one more in there, right? So it's uh, k plus 1 minus 1, which is just k. k plus 1 minus 1 times 2 to the k plus 1 plus 1, right? k plus 1 plus 1. 2 to the k plus 2. And I'll just spell it out for us. k plus 1 plus 1 plus another 2. I have to show that those, uh, that this is true. Using this as firepower, we can assume that, OK? So the secret is going to be breaking down this to look like that. We can take out the last term again, right? So let's do that. So this is equal to, well, let's, let's make it look like this, and then we'll take out the k plus 1th term. We'll say this is equal to the sum of all the j's starting at 1 up to just k, right? Up to just k of j times 2 to the j. That's all still fine. And then this had one more term. It had the k plus 1th term. So what, what was that? That was when j was k plus 1. So k plus 1 times 2 to the k plus 1. We have to show that that is equal to something, uh, all this over here. But I can do some rewriting now, OK? Because now I have this looking like this, and I can put this next to it now because that's supposed to be equal. We've, we've shown that. So by the inductive hypothesis, I can replace this with this. All right, this is equal to, all right, replacing this, k minus 1 times 2 to the k plus 1 plus 2. And then I still have all these guys, plus, plus another k plus 1 times 2 to the k plus 1. See that? And then now I need to somehow get it looking like this. And remember that this is this is just k now, and this is k plus 2, really. So that's what it really needs to look like. So how could I do that? I have a bunch of things times 2 to the k plus 1. Let's, let's extract those. Do you see that? So this is something times 2 to the k plus 1. This is another something times 2 to the k plus 1. Let's get them next to each other. And how many of those do I have, right? How many 2 to the k plus 1s do I have? I have k minus 1 here and k plus 1 here. Uh, and so that's going to be 2k, right? Because the ones cancel each other. It's 2 times k. It's 2k that many, OK? 2k times 2 to the k plus 1. And then, uh, let's see here, plus 2. That's, that's getting very close, right? I want this to be k times k plus 2 to the k plus 2. Do you see how I can get there? So this, this is just a big multiplication. This is 2 times k times 2 to the k plus 1. This. This 2, like this power of 2, it could be to a bigger power, right? Because if I had like 2 to the 1, if I multiply that by another 2, I get 2 squared. Same idea here. I can take this 2 and bring it into this to the power of something. So I can shove it into there. So now it's just the, the 2 goes away, k times, and this becomes one higher power. 2 to the k plus 2 plus 2. What do you know? That's what I needed to show, and that is my inductive step. So that really is true. This is a closed form. It works out. All right. So that's pretty fun. So that's with numbers. Maybe numbers make a bit more sense with induction, at least at the start. So isn't that cool? That's an exciting proof. Now you can replace that all day long. You've proved it once and for all. Here's another one for you to try. This one is some more number theory. So let's say I want you to prove this. Prove that for any positive integer, and so starting at 1 again for your base case, any, every positive integer, 7 evenly divides 9 to the n minus 2 to the n. So 7 is always a factor of that weird looking thing. So prove that. What's your base case? What's your inductive step? First of all, what's your p to the n, p of n? And then give that a try. All right, so 
for every positive integer and this is true about it so there again just screaming at you is your predicate there's p p of n and so we want to prove this for any positive integer so our base case should be the first one that we could possibly prove it for so that's n equals one so base case n is equal to one and so what I want to show now is that 7 divides 9 to the 1 minus 2 to the 1. Yeah, I have to show that 7 divides 9 to the 1, which is 9, minus 2 to the 1, which is just 2. So I need to show that 7 divides 7. Yeah, and that, that does check out because 7 times 1 is equal to 7. That's perfect. It goes in once, yeah? So that's, that's how you prove that QED for our base case. For our inductive step, again, assume p to the k, prove p to the k plus 1. Inductive step. I want to assume that this is true for k. Assume that 7 divides 9 to the k minus 2 to the k. Assume that's true. All right, so that's a thing. Uh, and then what I, want, what I want to show is it's true for k plus 1. Show that 7 divides 9 to the k plus 1 minus 2 to the k plus 1 somehow using this idea, this inductive hypothesis. All right. So, all right, this the syntax is not very helpful for us. Let's turn this into an equation that we can use. So if I'm assuming this, what does that mean equation wise? It assumes there's like a multiplication involved, right? So this is saying if 7 divides 9 to the k minus 2 to the k, what, what do I get from that? That's saying that 9 to the k minus 2 to the k, it's equal to a multiple of 7, right? It's equal to 7 times, I guess I can't use k anymore, 7 times j for some integer j, right? That's what it, that's the definition of divides. I'm just unpacking that. So that's what I can assume works out. And then I want to show this, right? And another way of showing that is, again, to unpack the definition. I want to show that 9 to the k plus 1 minus 2 to the k plus 1 equals 7 times something like uh, si times m for some integer m, okay? That's the secret, all right? And this is a bit of a harder example. We'll have to play around with the equations, but one way to do it is to solve for one of these guys, to solve for one of the powers. Let's solve for uh, nine, to the k nine to the k, so bring the two to the k to the other side. So again, I'm assuming this. Assume that nine to the k, I'll just bring the two to the k to the other side is equal to seven times j plus this time two to the k, yeah? That's what I'm assuming. And again, I want to show this is true. And I almost have this now. I have I have something I can replace. If I had 9 to the k, I could replace it. I almost have 9 to the k here, don't I? So if I can factor out a 9, I could have it, right? So 9 to the, let's see here, 9 to the k plus 1 minus 2 to the k plus 1. That's equal to, if I, if I take out some plus 1s, right, that's equal to 9 times 9 to the k, right? That's the same as 9 to the k plus 1 minus 2 times 2 to the k. That's the same as 2 to the k plus 1. And so this is this is a better thing to start with, because now I can, I can replace this. I know that I'm assuming this. I, I'm assuming that 9 to the k is equal to this. Let's do that replacement. So this is equal to, by the inductive hypothesis, that's equal to 9 times this guy, 7 times some integer j plus 2 to the k, minus 2 times 2 to the k, um, all right, let's, let's put, let's distribute that 9. So this is 9 times 7 times j. I promise this is going to work out. Plus 9 times 2 to the k minus 2 times 2 to the k. Okay, that's still all there. So now how many, how many 2 to the k's do I have? I have uh, 9 and 2 of them. 9 minus 2 of them. I have 7 of them. You see that? This is 7 2 to the k's plus whatever this guy is, plus 9 times 7 times j. That's just an integer, OK? And now I could, I could do the following. I have a 7 here, don't I? I'm trying to prove that this thing, which I started with, is equal to 7 times something. I can factor out a 7 now, can't I? That's the secret. So this is equal to, got a 7 on both of these, and it's equal to 7 times 2 to the k plus 9 times j, whatever that is. And I have no clue what this is, but I do know that it's an integer, right? It's uh, 2 to some integer power, 9 times some integer, and adding them together still makes another integer. 
So this, I found seven times something equaling my original idea. Okay, and that was what I needed to show. So this is what my m could be. Let, let m be whatever that is. And I have found an integer that multiplies by 7 to make my thing. So that means 7 really does divide 9 to the k plus 1 minus 2 to the k plus 1. It's a weird little result, but cool number theory stuff again. So that's, that's my inductive step again. Once those are both complete, the base case plus that one, I now have shown that this is true for every single positive integer n. I haven't shown you like what to multiply by. You'd have to do some math. There's your math. But uh, that is 7 is always a factor of this. Very, very cool. All right. So yeah, just a bunch of examples. Uh, so that was that is the normal, regular kind of mathematical induction. Uh, do yell at me if you have any questions about this. This is going to be like a very huge thing in the rest of your computer science career, so it's good to understand it now. Let's talk about a different flavor of induction. It's called strong induction. Right? Sometimes your inductive hypothesis is not enough, just like proving it for like p of the k, assuming p of the k is not enough to prove p of the k plus 1. So strong induction gets you there in a different way. It's, it's a kind of induction where the inductive step has more power, I guess. It's stronger. And so here's, here's what strong induction is about. Again, you prove your base case. You say p of the 0. You've got to show it at the start, once and for all. So that's still the same. Your inductive step changes. Your inductive step for strong induction is when you assume the following, or this is what you prove in, in the inductive step. You prove, you, you prove that for every k that's greater than or equal to 1, so after the base case, assume not just right p of the k implies p of the k plus 1, but assume that everybody before, p of the 0, p of the 1, all the way up to p of the k, assume that all of those imply p of the k plus 1. You're allowed to use every previous proof that you made, every previous number, p of whatever, before k plus 1, instead of just the most recent one, instead of just using p of the k, because maybe you needed this one, maybe you needed p of the 1. Now you have access to it. All right? So it's just showing, like, assuming all of these guys, not just p of the k. Assume that p of 0 is true. Assume that p of 1 is true. Da, 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 all the way to p of, p of the k. Use that as firepower. They all are accessible now to prove p of the k plus 1. So assume all of these to show this. All right? You can actually, which is funny, you can prove that strong induction works. It's a valid uh, proof argument with just normal induction. So it's actually not any stronger than normal induction. It's just it's less writing. All right, so technically it's not any, re not really stronger than normal induction. It's just like a different way of thinking about induction. You're allowed to access your previous proofs because you had them. You had them all along. So let me show you a few examples of this. It's, it's going to be cool. All right, so here's a fun uh, proof that is a very true statement about number theory, very important fact. Every positive integer that is greater than 1 can be written as a product of primes, right? We can always find a prime factorization of any number. Well, let's prove that. That's pretty cool, right? Base case. Base case inductive step. So uh, again, this is a predicate. The first number that it applies to is the number 2, right? That's the first thing bigger than 1. So that's the first integer. So let's say that n is 2. I have to show that 2 can be written as a product of primes, right? Well, 2 itself is prime. It already is a product of primes. So check QED for the base case. Let's do the inductive step now. So I'm going to, let's write this all out for the inductive step. I'm going to assume, assume all of the numbers, right? Not just k, k right? Not just that k can be written as product of primes, but any number between 2 and k. I get to use all of them. Assume all those numbers before k plus 1 can be written as a product of primes. All right, so that's all of my previous things. I'm going to use all of those facts to prove that k plus 1 can be written as a product of primes. Written as a product of primes. And what I need to show, need to show that k plus 1 itself now can be written as a product of primes. Can be written as a product of primes. So let's figure this out together. All right. So there's actually 
there's actually two cases to this one. Uh, either k plus 1 itself is prime, in which case like 2 were done, like you just list that when you were call it a day, or k plus 1 is composite. All right, so those are your two cases. So case 1, that's the easy case. If k plus 1 is already prime, you're done. It's either prime or not prime, though. If k plus 1 is in fact prime, we're good. K plus, you just write k plus 1 by itself. It's already a product of primes. k plus 1 by itself works. We didn't need the inductive hypothesis for that. Case 2, though, this is where it gets tricky and cool, and we need the power of all these previous things. If k plus 1 is factorable, it's composite. It has, it's made up of at least two numbers multiplied together. It's factorable, right? Uh, that implies that k plus 1 is equal to the product of at least two numbers, i times j, right? Two smaller numbers. They're forced to be smaller uh, to make the bigger thing, right? Because this is positive stuff. So these are two numbers, and we know that they are smaller than k plus 1 because they multiply to make k plus 1, right? They're two integers multiplied together to be k plus 1. So there's, it's some two factors of them. Uh, we can split up k plus 1 like that. What do we know about those two numbers? We know that they are between 2 and k, aren't they? So, okay, by the inductive hypothesis then, by the ih, i and j can both be, because they're smaller numbers, they are between 2 and k, they have to be, to be factors. They can be written as products of primes, because I assume that that's possible, all right? I assume that any of those numbers can be written as product of primes, as prods of primes, Cool. Therefore, k plus 1, which is equal to i plus j, just or sorry, i times j, sorry, i times j, you just like replace i with all the products of primes that it was, and j with all the products of primes that it was, and then you multiply them, it's still a big, it's a bigger product of primes. Do you see that? So that, therefore, it is a product of primes, the whole thing, the bigger original number. Yeah, and so that's my inductive step, and that's my proof. Isn't that cool? Isn't that powerful? So uh, we just showed that that works out, and I needed, like, I didn't know what these factors were. Or I have no control over, like, were these two factors, like, 2 and 7? Were they 8 and 3? I have no clue what they are. I just know that they're smaller than my k plus 1. So I needed, like, I needed the, the power of strong induction here because I wasn't sure what my factors were. I needed it to apply still. I needed this inductive hypothesis to apply because I had no, like, it's never going to be just k that was your factor to make k plus 1, right? It's going to be something smaller. And so it has to be a previous thing, and I have access to those previous things through strong induction. So that's beautiful. That's the secret. Let me show you a different example now. I would like to prove to you that for every integer starting at 11, greater than or equal to 11, the nth Fibonacci number is, uh, assuming n is greater than or equal to 11, it's greater than or equal to 1.5 to the power of n. Ooh, okay. So that's pretty cool. We can show this. We can bound, right? We can bound below. It's like an omega proof of the Fibonacci sequence. So base case. Again, I want to do my normal base case. I want to prove my smallest thing. So the smallest thing that this applies to is the number 11. You see that? So base case n is equal to 11. I have to figure out the 11th Fibonacci number, right? I have to show. What do I need to show? I need to show that fib of 11 is greater than or equal to 1.5 to the 11. Yeah. And so what is the Fibonacci number? Uh, that is the 11th one. Uh, I did this ahead of time. It, is, it happens to be 89. All right, and then also 1.5 to the 11th power, we can do that together. 1.5 to the 11th power, that is 86.5-ish, dun, dun, dun. which is smaller. Perfect. So that checks out for the base case at least. And now I need to show that my inductive step is true. And I'm going to do it using strong induction. And I'll show you why in just a second. Inductive step. I'm not going to just uh, assume p the k plus or p the k and prove p the k plus one. I'm instead going to assume everybody up to not just p the k, everybody 
p to the starting number, p to the 11, up to p to the k. I'm assuming that I have access to all those proofs. All of them are true. Dot, dot, dot. I have all of them at my disposal. I'm going to use them. I need to show that p to the k plus 1 is true still. I need to show that p to the k plus 1 is a true statement, uh, which expands to showing that fib of k plus 1, fib of k plus 1, uh, is greater than or equal to 1.5 to the k plus 1. See that? That's what I need to show now. And the reason I need strong induction, I can't just use p of the k, is because Fibonacci is defined using two previous elements, not just the previous one, not just the previous k. It's, per, it's shown using k and then also k minus 1, right? Here's, here's how you define the Fibonacci sequence, right? See, so it goes 0, then 1. 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and it's the two previous things, not just the, the one before it. So normal induction won't work. You need the two previous things to add together to make the next term. And of course, it's an infinite sequence. But this, now we can expand it, because we know how to define Fibonacci in terms of its previous elements, right? What is Fib of k plus 1? It's equal to Fib of k plus Fib, it's like 1 ago plus 2 ago fib of k plus fib of it's k minus 1. Right, that's 2. This, this minus 2. Does that make sense? That's the secret. And I can now use my inductive hypothesis because I know things about everything up to k, including fib of k minus 1. I can, I can do this replacement. You see that? That's my secret. That's what I can do now. I, can, I know that this is true for everybody between 11 and k. That's beautiful. So, uh, I guess, by the inductive hypothesis on both of these, right? Because this expands to that. By the inductive hypothesis on both of these ideas, I can plug it into here. What's fi I know that fib of k better be, like I'm assuming it, it's greater than or equal to 1.5 to the k, right? I, I have that by the inductive hypothesis, by strong induction. One point, that's greater than or equal to 1.5 to the k. And then likewise, this is true for k minus 1 as well. I'm assuming that fib of k minus 1 is greater than or equal to 1.5 to the k minus 1 this time. That's greater than or equal to 1.5 to the k minus 1. I need to show that that addition is still greater than or equal to that. Okay? So, okay. I know for sure, just based on these ideas, I can add them together, right? This is greater than or equal to these two guys. Just by the inductive hypothesis. I know that that, that sum is greater than or equal to these two things because this is true about that. This is true about that. There's a greater than or equal to relationship. So 1.5 to the k plus 1.5, there's a dot there, 1.5 to the k minus 1. And then now I can do some expanding, okay? This is equal to, let's, let's get like terms here, uh, 1.5 to the k minus 1. This can also look like 1.5 to the k minus 1 if I take out another point, 1.5, right? This first side is equal to 1.5 times 1.5 to the k minus 1. See that? That is equal to this. You just take out a 1.5. And then I still have this other guy, this other 1.5. 1.5 to the k minus 1. OK. Uh, all right, now I have a bunch of these. I have a bunch of things to the one uh, times 1.5 to the k minus 1. How many of those things do I have? I have 1.5 of them and another one of them. See that? So that's 2.5 of these things. So that's what I have. And then, all right, this is this is where you have to do some tricky math. 2.5. What is that? I need to I need to get this somehow looking like 1.5 of the k plus 1. So I need like another two 1.5s multiplied here. How does 2.5 compare to like if this were instead of this, if it were like 1.5 squared, like I could bring them together and it would be equal to 1.5 of the k plus 1, right? So how does 2.5 compare? to 1.5 squared. It's actually bigger. So this, this expression then is bigger than, therefore, it's bigger than 1.5 squared times 1.5 to the k minus 1. And we know that that is equal to 1.5 to the k plus 1. And after that, I have now shown that this side is greater than or equal to, well, it's actually strictly greater than, uh, which is still fine, strictly greater than that which, of course, then it's greater than or equal to. I needed to show that it was that this was true about it. And so I finally had that, that right-hand side that I needed. 
I've shown the relationship and it works out. It'll actually always be greater, but that is, that's what I needed to show. So you needed those two previous terms, so you needed strong induction again, right? You needed strong induction to, to get at this, uh, the proof of the, the two ago term rather than just the one that was right at, right before k plus one. Okay, again, strong induction to the rescue. You needed all of your previous proofs at your disposal. Uh, and so now uh, you know that if you write a function that somehow runs in Fibonacci time, it's actually an exponential algorithm, right? At best, this is a lower bound. You know, it's at best exponential. And if you want to go to the Wikipedia page on the Fibonacci sequence, uh, it approaches a fun little mathematical constant that's like true about nature. It's a, it's a fun number called phi. Uh, so Fibonacci, the nth Fibonacci number approaches like the, ra the ratio of the numbers. It's like, it approaches phi of n. And so that is, that's an exponential term. It's 1.5 something, it's bigger than 1.5. Okay, so that's the secret. Now you know, uh, and we used strong induction. We needed access to all of these, all of these terms, all of those proofs in our uh, inductive step. All right, a uh, few more topics for the lecture. Let's go and move on to something that is actually equivalent to induction, but it's a, it's a weird, cool idea, which just seems obvious, but actually it's, it's strong enough to be the same as induction, all right? It's called the well-ordering principle. It says that if you have some non-empty subset of the natural numbers, no matter which one, there's always a smallest element in that subset, which just seems super obvious, right? You, you make some non-empty subset of the natural numbers, eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine. You can put whatever you want in your subset. The well-ordering principle just says like, you can always find the smallest one there. There's always a smallest element. It's gotta be natural numbers though, because the smallest natural number exists, right? So. You can always just like look at the set and like there's always a way to find the smallest one. There's like a min function, which is pretty obvious. But surprisingly, just this idea of being able to find in a sub, uh, non-empty subset of natural numbers the smallest thing, just being able to do that, that is somehow equivalent to induction, all right? There's actually, like there is a proof, like you can prove that well-ordering implies mathematical induction and also the other way around. Uh, if you wanna read this, it's a proof by contradiction. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, it's like you're going to end up finding the smallest, like you're going to assume that induction is uh, false by contradiction. It's like, all right, that means that P of N must be like false for some N. It's not true for all of them. And then you're going to use well ordering to find the smallest one. There it is again. Uh, and then somehow like, okay, this would never have happened. Like you're going to discover a contradiction, but I don't, I don't have the time to prove that to you, sadly. Uh, go and look in your book or on YouTube if you want to. But well ordering is just as strong in, as induction, which is just as strong as strong induction. So like you could you have options when you want to make proofs now, but sometimes it's easier to to focus on this idea, the well ordering principle when you're making a proof. So let, let me show you some examples of that. All right, so here's here's a fun little theorem that uses the the well ordering principle. Let's say that we live in a universe where you can buy three cent stamps and five cent stamps. So maybe this is like a long time ago. But uh, I'm going to prove to you using the well ordering principle that any amount of stamp that you need, like you need a 52 cent stamp, I'm going to prove to you that anything eight cents or more, you can make it from a three cent and five cent stamp, a combination of any number of those. Okay. So that's, that's going to be the secret, right? This is going to be a proof by contradiction using the well ordering principle, proof by contradiction. All right, so, okay. We're trying to prove that any postage worth a cents or more can be made from three cents or five cent stamps. So, all right, uh, by contradiction then, we're gonna assume that this is not true. We're gonna assume that there are some stamps that can be made that, uh, like, or sorry, there are some stamps that you, you know, some numbers that you can't make, some cent amount that you can't make with just three cent and five cent stamps over eight cents, okay? So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna find we can list them out then, or if we're assuming this doesn't always work, let's list out all the different cent values. We'll find all the cent values that this doesn't work for, because we're assuming it doesn't work, right? And that will lead to a contradiction. Find all the cent values for which this doesn't hold, for which the statement doesn't 
hold true. Okay, and so the while ordering principle, we can always appeal to that. We're gonna we're gonna appeal to it now. Like, all right, you've made a list of all the ways that this this theorem doesn't work. Assume that you could do that. Uh, I'm gonna find a contradiction there. So what are the, you've made a list for me of all the sent values that this statement doesn't hold for. So, all right, we can ask for the smallest one. That's what the well ordering principle tells you. You can always ask for the smallest one, right? Because this is, it's a bunch of numbers. It's just a bunch of natural numbers. So let's, let's call the smallest, the smallest amount that this does not work for. We're assuming it can't, you, there's one that it doesn't work for. Call the smallest one amount a, all right? First of all, let's notice that a better be greater than 10, all right? There are kind of some base cases involved here. So here, here are your base cases to this proof, even though it's not induction. It is just as strong as induction, though. So uh, this is going to be helpful for me. Let's, let's just show that a must have been at least 11, all right? This, this amount for which it didn't work. Because, like, all right, I'll, that means I need to show that there's a way to make an 8-cent stamp out of 5 and, five and 3. Yeah, you can totally make eight cents out of a one three cent stamp plus a five cent stamp, right? So there's that. And then, all right, I need to show that it works for nine cents. There's a way to use three and five cent stamps to make nine cents. It's just like use three three cent stamps, right? So that one's fine. And then to make a 10 cent stamp, just use two five, two five cent stamps, right? And so this is going to help me now, all right? So call the smallest amount a. Uh, so it must have been at least 11, right? This number that we're claiming it didn't work for, for which this theorem did not hold. All right. And all right, that's that's kind of nice. Because we know it's at least 11, we can say this now. But here's our contradiction. But this amount a that we couldn't make stamps for, we couldn't figure it out. A minus 3, right? That's a smaller number. Because it's always like if it was 11, a minus 3 was 8, right? a minus 3 did work. It was at least, uh, or sorry, it was at most, uh, no, sorry. I, I can't do this. It's backwards in my mind. a minus 3 must have been at least, yeah, at least 8. So it's 8 or bigger. And we know that that, that amount did work, right? a minus 3, because that wasn't the smallest one. That one must have held. That one did work. A minus 3 did work. We could find stamps for that one. And A minus 3 was at least 8. It was greater than or equal to 8. And so I know how to make stamps for like 8, 9, 10, all the way above. I know how to make 3, three before, right? And so really, just like go 3 ago where you didn't know how to do it and just add another 3 cent stamp. So like this is claiming like maybe 12 was 12 cents. It's like I couldn't make it for 12 cents. But this proof is saying, no, no, sorry, that doesn't work. That makes no sense because you could have made a nine cent thing and then just added another three cent stamp. That's kind of how the proof is going. All right. That's the secret there. So just add another three cent stamp. And you're good. Isn't that silly? So, uh, so just the fact that we can find the smallest thing that smallest thing was going to lead us to a contradiction there. All right, and so that proves our theorem. It's like, all right, then it must have worked for all of them because the smallest one, there could be no smallest one that it didn't, that it doesn't work for. That's the, that's the double negation of proof by contradiction there. Very, very, it's a little complicated. I'll give you that, but that's that's a good use of the the, of the well ordering principle rather than normal induction to prove something about everybody. Right? Again, this is a for all proof. Let's try another one. Let me actually prove to you the division algorithm. This will be fun. I, I promised this to you long ago in our number theory slides, so let me actually follow through on that. So here's the division algorithm. All right? Let n be an integer and d be a positive integer. So n's our number and d is the thing we're dividing it by. Right? That's the divisor. There are q, integers q and r, quotient and remainder, such that n is equal to q times d plus r, and r is in, within that normal range that a, that a remainder should be, because it can't be any bigger then it can't be D, because then it could have gone in one more time, right? So this is going to be a use of the well-ordering principle, surprisingly. Because what we're going to do is, let's say we're trying to divide a number. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make a set that we can find the smallest thing in. So here's what we're going to do. 
I'm not going to test you on this, by the way. This is a very complicated idea. But it's a good use of the well-ordering principle. So let's make this set. Make the set s. That's equal to n minus t times d for every integer t, where where t is in the nat or, sorry is in the integers, and n minus t times d. It's still a positive number, right? Still, or sorry, it's still non-negative at least, because then it's this will give us a set starting at at least zero, right? It's uh, it's going to be 0 or bigger. It's going to be the numbers involved will be 0 or bigger. And those are natural numbers that I can use the well-ordering principle on. Okay, So I'm going to make this weird looking set that is this number n minus any, every single multiple, right? Every single multiple of the divisor d. Does that make sense? So let's say we're trying to divide 7 by 3. This is kind of, this is the set s that we're going to make, assuming we're trying to divide 7 by 3. So n is 7. And I'm trying to show like 7. We know that 7, right? This is true about it. 7 is equal to uh, something times 3 plus some remainder. That's what we're trying to solve for. Okay, And the way that we're going to do it, the way that we're going to show that this always works, that there's always a way to find a quotient and a remainder that always follow these rules, we're going to build this set. Right? n minus t times d, where t is an integer, and that difference is at least 0. So here is the secret. Uh, here's the set I'm going to build. So you can totally have t be 0. So n minus 0 is part of this set. So 7. 7 is our n, right? This is our d. 7 is in the set. And then I have, uh, let's see here. What else do I have? I could have 1 in the set, right? And 7 minus 1 times 3. That's still greater than 0. So that's 4. 4 is in the set. Uh, 1 is in the set. And I'm picking out all the ones that are positive. Like I could go farther. I could be like minus... Uh, minus 3 times 3, and that would be minus 9, right? So that would make uh, negative, negative 1, right? Yeah, it's just minus another 3. So I think at least 1, 1 minus 3. No, I think that's negative 2, actually, right? Negative 2, that's a little too small, though. I won't consider it. Negative 5 as well. That's like a little too small. I won't consider it. So I'm only picking out the ones n minus some integer times d that's greater than or equal to 0. So that's the secret. It's 4, 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5. So all those things, only the positive ones. So I could go bigger as well. I could be like minus negative 1 times 3. That's fine. So like that's uh, that'll put like 10 in here. But I'm going to build this set. It's, it is an infinite set because you can make things bigger. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to find the smallest element in this set s. See what I'm doing now? This is actually the remainder, isn't it? Uh, find the smallest. And the well-ordering principle lets you do that. Find the smallest element in S. Call it R, because it is R. All right? Uh, so that, that was our R. We just making that set finds your R for you. So it really is something times 3 uh, plus 1. And for some reason, my mouse is not happy. But that is R. That's for sure going to be R. We just solved for that. Just came out of being the smallest thing in the special set that we've created. And then we can then finally solve for this last question mark, which is our quotient. This is going to end up being 2, though. Okay, So we're going to also be able to find this. So that was R. It's going to work out. Uh, also, R is it is a valid remainder. It's, it's within this range, right? R is less than D because if R were bigger than or equal to D, you could have subtract another integer multiple of D and still had it be non-negative. You see that? There could have been a smaller thing. There could have been a smaller element in S. So just like a very quick by contradiction, it must be this. This better be true. There could have. It's like an inner proof by contradiction. There could have been a smaller element in S. So we know that this is true about R, and it's also greater than or equal to 0, right? So we have the other side as well. That's perfect. OK? And then what we do is we call the t that we used. That's the secret. Call the t that you used to generate that R value. Call the t for this one. Q. See that? That's the secret. 
That's how we prove the division algorithm. So it was the 2, right? And 7 minus 2 times 3. That gave me my answer of 1. That, that produced the smallest element in this set. And so that happened to be my quotient, all right? And so now, n minus q times d, just by definition of the set, right? That was equal to my r. And I can just rearrange this to, to look like this equation, right? n is equal to q times d plus r, and then also r is within that range. So this is showing me that I can always find a quotient and a remainder with this true about the remainder. And that was my division algorithm. So now I have a way to generate these things. It technically gives me an algorithm, but that that is finally the division algorithm proved to you. And we needed to find the smallest number in a set of in a subset of the natural numbers. And so that gave me uh, an excuse to use the well ordering principle. Okay. So with that, uh, I got three more slides, and I want to switch gears to talk about programs now. All right. Let's go to program verification. So let's say that we got a program, and we want to show that it is a correct program. All right. There's a way. There's plenty of ways to do this. One way to do it is to show that if a a certain precondition is true before the program starts, like a, a precondition is just a logical statement that is true pre everything, right? Precondition before everything. Then we want to show that the program will end after a finite number of steps. Show that it's not stuck in in an infinite loop. And then also there's a post condition that's true, all right? Post after everything's over. And so you can also do pre and post conditions for individual statements. All right, so here's a very simple, heavily commented for no reason uh, function, compute sum on x, y, and z. Its job is to right, return the sum of x plus y plus z. Let's prove. Let me teach you some basic program verification. Let's prove that this is always going to return this. It's always going to return that answer, x plus y plus z of its original things. Right? So the the secret is with pre and post conditions on each statement. So like there's a precondition about this guy and a post condition about this guy. Something is true. All right. So here's here's what you do. So our precondition for this entire algorithm is that x, y, and z are like correct types. They're just numbers. You don't really need to assume much when this function gets called. Like you got it called with some numbers x, y, and z. All right. And then we run this line. What's a post condition of this line? What is true after this line is done once and for all? Right. Well, we just introduce a new variable. So we know after this line, post condition for line one, that sum, the sum variable, it's always going to hold zero, right? There's, there's no other way to read that. Sum will hold zero now, for sure. So that's something we can prove. And then also, we know that x, y, and z are still numbers. We never changed them. So we still have all that, OK, from the, the first assertion. All right? And then I'm going to run some statements. I'm going to add into sum. Sum equals sum plus x. All right? So what do I know? about this line. What's the post condition? Assuming this is true before, sum is 0 before, what's true about it now? Well, I'm adding into sum its old value, which I know is 0. I proved that, plus x. So after this line is done, sum must hold x. Do you see that? That's, that's where I'm going with this. We've just proven that sum right now holds the number x using our precondition. That's the post condition of this line. All right? It's always just from the perspective of the line you're talking about. You've got a precondition and a post condition. All right, now this one. Assuming this is true before the line, sum is equal to x. If I run this line, I'm going to add x to y and now shove that back into sum. Sum is equal to x plus y. Hoo hoo. And so I have one more line to run. This is its pre precondition. I know I've just proven that this is true before. What's true after now? If sum is equal to this and I'm adding z to that, what's the final thing in sum? Sum is equal to the original x plus y plus that z. All right? And that's what I'm returning. And sum is equal to this value, which is what I needed to show. All right, that's how you can prove, like, legitimately prove that your program is correct. You're verifying that it's correct, and just implicitly, we've shown that it's going to end after a finite number of steps. There's no loops, so there's there's no question about that. Okay, but that's that's basic program verification, and you can you can like step this up to like work for larger programs, and the secret for that is usually going to be finding what's called an invariant, something that doesn't change. All right, so an invariant is a statement that is always true regardless of how much stuff has happened in your program. All right, so an invariant about a chess board, for example, is like if you put a bishop right here, let's call this 0, 0. Like this is a coordinate system. He's, he's sitting at 0, 0 right now. Uh, you can prove that he's never going to get to this place, 4, 3. All right, there's no way for him to ever get there. There's an invariant there. 
You see why? What's the invariant about how bishops move in chess? They always stay on the color square that they're on, right? They're always going to be on the darker squares if this one starts on a dark square. He's never going to go to a light square. That's your invariant. That shows that no matter how many weird infinite movements you can make with this bishop, he's never getting near, unless you cheat. Do you see that? That's an invariant. It's a statement that's always true, no matter how many times, how many moves I've made with this bishop. It doesn't matter. That's the secret, right? So uh, that leads us to the concept of loop invariance. That's going to help us prove stuff about loops. A loop invariant is a statement that you can make. It's true no matter, no matter how many times you've run that body of your loop. All right? That's the secret. And so it's essentially the precondition of the loop is its own postcondition. Right? That's, that's the idea. Because like, it should still be true. This invariance should still be true. Uh, but also you know that the condition of the loop must have been, uh, must be false if you ever plopped out of the loop. And that's also uh, something nice to know. All right, this is, I promise that this is worth it to make invariance about loops, things that don't change even if you run the loop infinitely many times. Uh, and let me give you an example of that. Here's a function that's going to compute the power of a number to another number, assuming that n is an integer. All right, so we're going to compute this power of xn. The, its job is to return x to the power of n. And so I'm going to start some variables, all right? And I can prove stuff about them. j is equal to 0, power is equal to 1. So I know, like, right here, the post condition of these two lines is that, well, j is mathematically equal to 0. It holds that number. Power, that variable, is equal to 1. And now I want to make a loop invariant that does something. Because what, what this does, right, let's say, let me run this for a few iterations. Let's say that x is equal to 2 and j is equal to 3. Like, I want to run this program with x equal to 2 and j equal to 3. So like, let's, let's watch how power, that variable, and j, that variable, change. How they change in lockstep. So like, at the, at the start of the program, j is equal to 0, power is equal to 1. So j is equal to 0, power is equal to 1. So like, they're corresponding there. And then as I run this loop, while j is less than n, and uh, sorry, this is not j, it's supposed to be n is equal to 3. n equal to 3. Uh, and this is like power in j now. So is j right now 0 less than n? Sure is. So let's do the loop. Power is equal to power times x. So power is equal to power times x. That makes it 2. And then we increment j to be 1. And then we continue the loop because 1 is still smaller than 3. See that? So let's run this. Legitimately run it. We're going to multiply x again. So this is now 4. j becomes 2. Another iteration of the body. 2 is still smaller than 3. So I'm going to compute this. Uh, multiply one more time by power by x. So now it's 8, and j gets incremented one more time to 3. Then we go back to this condition, right? Check it, and we're finally done. Like, it, it really is, it's equal now, so it's not strictly smaller. So that's perfect. And so we're done, we return the power, and we want to prove that this is going to be x to the n, always. All right? So what is our invariant? Power and j, they change, but I'd like to make a statement about these variables that kind of like corresponds all the time, all right? After each iteration of the loop and also before the loop, what's true about power and j? Do you see how they correspond to each other in a nice way? It's always x to the j is equal to power. Do you see that? 2 to the 0, that is 1. 2 to the 1, that is 2. 2 to the 2, that is 4. 2 to the 3, that is 8. That's the correspondence between power and j, and that's always true. It's not changing, even though those variables themselves are changing. It's invariant. So this is our loop invariant. This is going to help us show that this thing that we're returning is the final answer. This is true about our loop. Power is equal to x to the j all the time. All right. And so we want to prove that this is a true loop invariant, which means we need to show that it's true before the loop starts. Is this true about j equals 0 and power equals 1? Yeah, it sure is. That's true there. And then I also need to show that if this is true before the loop, it's also true after the loop has completed once. All right, so if I know that power is equal to x to the j right now, as I run this loop, I'm going to make a new power variable, power prime. That's equal to the old power, which I knew was equal to x to the j, times x, equals x to the j. I know that that's what it was. I'm going to multiply it by x. So that's what's true about it after the loop is over, times another x, which is equal to x to the j plus 1. That's perfect. And then also, j is going to be incremented. So the new j after this loop is done, j prime, that's equal to 
the old j plus one. See that? So this is what's true after the loop is completed. Is this still true? Is this statement still true about the new power and the new j, the, j, the, the ones with primes? Well, yeah. x to the j prime power is equal to power prime. See that? So it really does hold. It's working out. Uh, and then also you know that when a loop stops, assuming it does stop, the condition of this loop is done. So we've proven the invariance true. And also when this loop is over, we know that uh, j must be greater than or equal to n right here, right? j better be greater than or equal to n. That, that's the only thing that could have stopped this loop. And also because of the way that j is being incremented by 1 from 0, we know that the first time this is going to be true is when j is in fact equal to n. Okay, so j is equal to n at the end of this loop, and then we're returning whatever's in the power variable. But I know, because of my invariant, that this must be, right, what am I returning? It's equal to x to the j, right? I'm returning x to the j for sure, because that's what power is always set to. Must be x to the j. And I know what j is equal to now, because we stopped the loop. j must be equal to n, which is equal to x to the n, which is exactly what I wanted to show. So even a function with a loop, you can prove that it's always going to work, regardless of what x was, regardless of what n was, assuming it was like a positive number. Uh, this will always work out. We found an invariant that's true for our loop before it starts. And also, if you assume, it's kind of like a direct proof, assuming that the invariant's true before the loop, you run the loop once, show that it's still true afterwards about the new values, then it's never changing. It's always correct. And then we know what happens when our while loop stops. We know what's true about that. And we have a way to relate, based on our invariant, this return value. And so there is our answer. That's what's being returned. And that is proving, that's verifying, that this power function is correct. It does take a lot of work to prove once and for all, regardless of the values, that, that a function is right. But like, think about like safety-critical programs, like the programs that, are, that live inside of uh, an airplane. People are doing this with those kind of programs all day long to make sure that at least the software is not the, the reason that the plane blows up. All right? So that is a very, very cool thing that you could get into one day, and uh, this was your first taste of it. So I don't want to melt your, br uh, your brain too much, and so that's where I want to stop for now. We have one lecture left for induction and recursion. I think you can kind of see how we're, we're switching gears to programs, and so we're going to get to recursion uh, in this next lecture. So I will see you then.